Excellent. Well, welcome to the Marketplace Catalyst again. And I want to give a presentation today for us to kind of lay some ground rules. Um, what I call the, protocol, the protocols of the kingdom. How do you actually live out in the abundant life? And so I was uh, been writing about this and teaching on this for many, many years over uh, since uh, college when I asked the Lord, how does life work? And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I was trying to explain to a, uh, a teenager <laughs> about five or six years ago about what I was writing about and what I was teaching on. And I said, what's a good title for understanding the gifts of life of intimacy, authority, and resources. And oh yeah, what the world doesn't know about sex, power, and money. <laughs> so that was a catchy title. So I decided that we'd throw that in for today. Uh, what does sex, power, and money have to do with business? And so let me share a little bit about my family and who I am. Get over to the click here. This is my wife, Susan. Uh, she's from the Portland metro area, Vancouver. We met down in Modesto, California, when I was doing a convention down there with Full Gospel Business Students Fellowship International, their Northern California branch. She was a sales manager with Redline Hotels, and a week later, uh, we were dating, and then a year later, we were married. So uh, God is good, and, and I was married at 31, so I met Susan at 30, just like Joseph was given a wife at 30 and got married, and now you know, he had two boys and then I had two boys. So a lot of parallels there. <laughs> Why Joseph, one of my favorite characters. Uh, my wife did uh, resign from uh, being with the Hilton Hotels eventually as a director of sales and marketing and had our third son, Alec, who uh, was it born in the car on the way to the hospital. So that's another amazing story and journey. And then this is our full family a couple of Christmases ago. So our little son got my wife's hair, what I always wanted as a kid. <laughs> And then William and, and Alec are sitting next to me. So that's, that's uh, who I am. Another little thing about uh, the work that I've been doing, I do have my own company called Kingdom Technologies Group, LLC. And that's how I get paid. I do contracts to be uh, the executive director with Serving Our Neighbors. And then I also help out uh, with the Reformation uh, National Day of Prayer. I was a part of that for about 10 or 12 years here in the Oregon area and helped coordinate that. Now I'm just a regional coordinator for that here in the Portland metro area. Got connected with uh, Cindy Jacobs back in 2010 at a conference there in, in San Jose and became her uh, marketplace advisor. So it's always good to have connections with her. And we've been praying into what Cindy Jacobs has prophesied over this region since 1997 when she was here at City Bible Church for one of their prayer conferences that they were doing at that time. And so a lot of the things that, that we believe God's about to do is going to be taking place is what she articulated uh, there as well as several other places about Portland being a city of refuge, Oregon being a beacon of righteousness and justice about a marketplace revival that was going to hit the Northwest that would change the nation and so forth. And so a lot of the things that we're doing is in partnership with uh, her heart and with her and her husband, Mike. Cindy Jacobs, yeah, Cindy, yeah. And then um, the Reformation Prayer Network is her a prayer network around the region. Uh, I also have been to Israel several times, and on my third trip, uh, we were connecting uh, with Ashkelon, Israel, the city there, because Portland has a sister city with Ashkelon, Israel for the last 35 plus years, and so I work with that, and I serve the mayor's office in Portland in with the sister cities program, so all of the sister cities, we have nine of them from around the world that all partner with each other, and I host their monthly meeting at City Hall, but now on Zoom, and then do their annual uh, event uh, reception as well as uh, their entry in the Grand Floral Parade. That's a fun thing because we <clears throat> transitioned the, the Grand Floral Parade, which is a big, huge parade that's been done in downtown Portland over a hundred years. Uh, and we made it into a prayer walk. So as we're in the parade, we're sounding shofars, introducing the sister cities, then we're shouting shalom all over the city. <laughs> you know? And done that for about four or five years until obviously last year and this year because of COVID. And then I also serve um, with uh, Chris Overstreet with uh, Compassion Action, was his community collaborator and co co volunteer coordinator when he did his event. We had 7,500 folks from 25 nations and 40 states and really began to see what was birthed at Azusa Now with Lou Engel come to fruition and the revival that we've been praying into. There was more activity happening on the streets of Portland uh, during that week of the convention, uh, the conference, uh, when he had his uh, friends and, uh, and, and folks engaging with that, then there was actually happening inside the hall with 7,500 people. It was crazy, the ministry that was taking place, and God was seeding into. Uh, the final thing that we've been working on now is we took a, a homeless uh, 
uh, ministry called Helping Hands, and they were able to acquire a, a building that was built by Multnomah County, our local county here, for about 58 million, and then maintained it as an empty building for 16 years for another 40 million, almost $100 million later, and tax revenues, and God answered prayer, and that building is now the Bobby Lakes Hope Center, and so we've been open for a year, and I've been helping out, serving as the outreach coordinator for that to engage people to come and see what this place is. Since October, we've helped over 500 people come through and get jobs, get housing, get their life back together. And so it's an amazing work. Once we're open with the full remodel coming up in January, we'll be able to help 4,500 people a year come through this amazing center. And that's going to make a huge dent in the 20 to 25,000 people that are homeless in the city of Portland. And it's crazy, you know, there's about four or five, maybe two or three, and the number's really vague as far as who are actually uh, transient and being are on the streets all the time and don't wanna get off the streets, but there's a fluctuating a number as well, <clears throat> close to almost, like I said, 20, 25,000 people that are facing or in some capacity of homelessness, couch surfing, living in cars and campers around the city. And the leadership of our city has really allowed that to happen, but we have a, a kingdom solution for making that a reality. So that's a little bit about myself. I do want to um, engage uh, in this particular teaching to kind of unpack some things and set the stage here. And one of our theme verses for Serving Our Neighbors, uh, since we started in 1999 and then set up as a nonprofit uh, public charity in 2008, is Jeremiah 29, verse 7 and then 11 through 13. Seek inquire uh, for and require and request the peace, the shalom, and the welfare of the city to which I've called you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in the welfare of the city in which you live, you will have welfare or you will prosper is another word for that. And so there's two things happening here. God's saying, seek the peace of the city. And he's talking about them about to go into 70 years captivity in a wicked system called Babylon. And he says, seek the peace of the city. What? How can you do that as captives? You can. <laughs> and he says, pray to the Lord that it would prosper so that you can prosper. And so that's been a huge theme verse for us. The other uh, verses of 11 through 13, it says, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plan for your welfare and for peace and not for evil, to give you a hope in your final outcome. Then you will call upon me. And you will come and pray to me, and I will hear and I will heed you. Then you will seek me, inquire of and require of me as a vital necessity, and find me when you search with me with all of your heart. One of the first prophetic words that I got back in 1990, I was working for Full Gospel Businessmen's Headquarters, and I was in Southern California, Costa Mesa, California, there with uh, Dima Shakarian, and I got a call to speak at a chapter of Full Gospel up in Fallon, Nevada, which is north of Nevada. Uh, area um, near uh, Carson City and so forth, uh, Reno. And I went and showed up and this guy walked in and said, I've got a word for you. And are you James Archer? And I said, yeah. I said, a couple months ago or whenever I had a guy who was teaching and he was called me out of the audience of about three or 400 women aglow folks and said, I got a word for you to deliver to the Autry family. And I don't know any Autry's and you're the only one. <laughs> so he showed up and on a cassette player, he played this word saying that God is going to heal our oldest uh, uncle, my, my uncle, my dad's brother, oldest brother of, of, of cancer, and he had just been diagnosed with cancer, and that God wanted to move the Autry family into the fullness of what the Lord wanted, because they went to church, you know, they were raised Christians, <clears throat> but they didn't really live like it throughout the week, and, you know, that's just the way it is in Georgia, and so um, the Lord said to you, I have this one requirement. And that is that you give me your heart. And that's what he's talking about here. God wants us to give him our hearts. And so I took that little cassette, <laughs> mailed it to my dad in Georgia, and had him play it for my uncle. And God taught me a real interesting lesson. And this is what I'm going to share today and how we engage with this. <clears throat> and that is my, my uncle heard that word. He'd just been diagnosed with lung cancer because he'd been a smoker all his life. And he basically says, I don't believe that way. And he died. And I'm just like stunned. God sends me all the way from Southern California to Nevada, gives a word to this other guy who's at a conference somewhere who doesn't really plan on this. And he shows up when I'm speaking and sharing my testimony. 
God, God goes way out of his way <laughs> to heal my uncle of, of cancer. And I'm, I'm pretty sure when he got to heaven, he's Jesus saying, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, it's like, I did all this to make sure that you knew that I wanted to minister to your body. And yet all the time in every particular situation, when God speaks to our heart, we have to agree with it. We have to come into alignment with it. We have to say, yes, that's what I want. When the angel showed up to Mary and said, you're going to have the son of God. And she said, how's that going to happen? And then she said, yes. And that's the shift where she moved into a place of agreement. And so we have to do that as well. And then we know the story of Esther 4, 14. <clears throat> if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance shall arise from the Jews from elsewhere. But you and your family, your father's house will perish. And who knows, but it, you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this and for this occasion. So it's very important that we seek for the, the welfare of our city. We pray, we engage, we, we hear what God is saying about that, how we can be a part of that, how we can be the answer to that prayer. We do that from our heart and that we do that in sync and alignment with what God's doing around us. <clears throat> so let me share a little illustration as well that kind of drive this home. And it's a story of the three pits that God shared with me. One of them is that there's people that believe that God helps themselves. God helps those who help themselves. And so basically this is a perspective of a, a, a three sons were told by their father, if they ever fell into a pit, he'd get them out. And that's the word, that was a promise, right? Okay, <clears throat> the, so one of the sons fell into a pit, totally forgot about or ignored what the father had said to him and said, and tried everything he could do to climb out of the pit, figure out some way to get out and never got out. And so God, there's that one particular analogy that, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Like every, we got to do everything and, and God doesn't have a part to play. He just set everything up and then went away and he'll check on us later. You know, <laughs> the other perspective is that God answers the prayers of faith of those that who have a hope in him. And that's the perspective that I'm going to talk about in a second, but I'm going to go to the third perspective. And that is the perspective where I was stuck growing up. And that is that God does it all, no matter what. He's totally in charge. It doesn't matter what I do. And basically, it's all going to work out, you know. <laughs> and that's the guy that fell in the pit. And he saw that there was a rope hanging in the middle of the pit. And it went into the clouds. And what did he do? He tied it around his waist and yanked on it and said, okay, God, pull me up. <laughs> and nothing happened. And he's yanking on the, on the rope. You know, it's taut. And he just sits there and doesn't get out of the pit because he thinks God's got to do everything. All I got to do is tie it around my waist and get out. But the third son, the one in the middle there, is that son saw the rope, saw the rope had every foot, a knot tied in the rope. And so he used his brains, he used his arm muscles, and he grabbed a hold of the first rope knot, then the second knot, then the next knot, and the next knot. He's totally leaning upon that rope that disappears into the sky, but he's using what God gave him to engage with that. So the word hope is tikva in the Hebrew, and it means rope. The word hope means rope as well. It says that Rahab tied a scarlet rope in her window. That was her hope. And so the analogy there is that that rope is that hope. And the other thing the Lord shared with me about faith, and that is, he said, everywhere you see the word faith, I want you to put the word agreement in the Bible. It's the fight of agreement. The just shall live by agreement. The prayers of agreement will heal the sick. That changed everything for me. When I understood that the demons believe in God and shudder in terror, but they're not in agreement with God, they're working against God. But the faith that God talks about is agreement faith. It's a faith where you are, okay, I know this rope is here. This is the promise God gave me. If I ever fell into a pit, I would get out. That's from him. I'm going to engage my faith in that rope, and I'm going to pull out. And that's how we move into uh, engagement of fullness. So I, I rephrase that, that middle guy there who gets it, <laughs> is that God answers the prayers of agreement of those who grab that grab that rope, which is him. And we have our, our Saturday morning SWAT team, which is see what agreement transforms. And we've been praying in downtown Portland for the last six years and seeing God do some pretty amazing stuff. Does that make sense to everybody? 
appreciate you all engaging with us. I want to just check on our audience here online. Super. All right, very good. So I'm going to break down a couple of tools that God gave us to utilize in life. I did have a website up called knowinglife.org, but that's not currently up. I need to retool that. Uh, so you can't go there right now, but it will be there again in the future. But the first tool I want to talk about is the tool of truth, that promise. It's a statement of reality from God's perspective. It's the written word and the living word. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. The other is a promise. A promise is an agreement that involves conditions and consequences. The other tool that God gives us is the tool of faith that I've talked about. That's a positive action of our spirit soul man. When God gives us a promise, when there's a birth in the promise, God said to Abraham, you're going to have a son and he's going to become a nation. As the numerous of the, sky, uh, the, the skies and the sea, the sand on the seashore. But he had to appropriate, he had to move in a positive direction inside his spirit man and inside his mind, will, and emotions, as well as his body. We'll talk about that in a minute, toward the birth of that promise. So he believed God and God considered him righteous. Then you have the element of hope that I just talked about. What happened after God showed him that? He was barren. His wife was barren for 25 years. <laughs> you know, Jesus on the cross died. You know, he had the promise of being the Messiah and bringing salvation to the world. He's dead, you know, and that's when we apply hope. That's when we grab a hold of that rope in our soul and our, our body, and we engage a positive action toward that promise during that death period. And then the third element is God's love, and that is experiencing the Father's heart as he brings about the, re the resurrection of that promise. So God gives us these tools of truth, of promise, of faith, of hope, and of love. And love, uh, I think in the Hebrew context there is, is to, uh, re is, you know, really engaging and revealing the Father's heart. The other tool that God gave us is the gift of grace. And grace has different functions based upon where we are in our development, in our spiritual life, as well as in our business life. Again, a lot of this stuff has context in the business world, and you'll see that in a minute. But God says, I am what I am because of the grace of God. And for babies, for, you know, the whole focus when you're a new believer is that you're just excited and you just want to do everything for him, right? That's the whole analogy. You're just happy and, you know, God is good and just amazing thing is happening and your whole focus is for him. And then there's a stage where you move in your development with the Lord where the grace shifts and your whole focus that you want to be with him. Henry Blackaby with his spirits and God did an amazing course where he says, if you want to find out what God's doing, then go you know, talk to him and, and look at that and see what that is in this city and, and be able to be a part of that. And so when our kids were little and they were with Susan all day long and then I came home and then we went somewhere in two different cars or we met somewhere, you know, usually on the way home, the kids wanted to be with Papa because <laughs> they hadn't seen me all day, you know. And so that's the stage that takes place. But there's a big shift that happens as we grow up in the Lord and the Lord starts pouring out grace upon us to move us to a place like teenagers where he's going to give us something and train us and work in our life and, and so whole focus of God's grace on your life is for you it's for you to become the man of God he wants you to be and you move beyond just being happy that you're saved to just wanting to be with God to where he starts working on stuff inside of you in your business and so forth and his whole focus is to teach you how to drive <laughs> you know when my dad gave me a car it was a, a, a orange pumpkin orange a Datsun truck you know stick shift and I got to get out there and, and learn how to drive that thing and I did donuts around the pecan trees in the backyard and so forth but my dad did not get in the car because <laughs> if I wrecked that thing he wasn't going to get hurt you know he just said here's the keys go learn how to drive it but he obviously taught us how to do it and so forth but he's he's that whole focus is on training us up but guess what there's more and that more aspect is the grace of God then starts to shift where that is now where he wants to be with you. And that's sons and daughters. When my dad was alive, he, he and my mom came to Portland a couple of years ago. And out of the blue, we we're just sitting in the living room. He said, hey, let's go somewhere. And we did. He didn't care where we went. He didn't care what we did. But he knew that I knew him. And he knew that if he went with me, we would go somewhere we would both enjoy rather than him not wanting to you know, be with it. He just wanted to spend time with me. And that's an amazing stage 
in your development and in your walk with God to where God wants to show up and hang out with you and what you're doing. You're at this place where he's trained you, he's equipped you, you're moving in, you're, you're in the flow, and all of a sudden, you're doing what he's called you to do, and guess what? He shows up. <laughs> he shows up to be with you because he wants to be a part of it and be intricately engaged in it, and that whole amazing level of grace and maturity is just a game changer. When you've prepared a place that is walking in the things I'm going to talk about next, mm -hmm. where God feels comfortable to hang around you. You're thinking his thoughts, you're doing things his ways, you're saying things the way he would say things, and guess what? He wants to hang out with somebody like that. He looks to and fro throughout the whole earth whom he could show himself strong, it says, I think, in Daniel. God is in this place where he wants to dwell with us in the cool of the day here on this planet, and he's looking for sons and daughters, not babies, not just kids, not teenagers. He's looking for sons and daughters. And all of creation is moaning and groaning for the full revelation of the sons and daughters of the kingdom. They're looking. All of creation is looking for that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The next tool is righteousness. Righteousness is being in right relationship with God and within others and the gifts of life that I'm going to talk about next. And this is the core element of the teaching and sharing that I've been called to, to engage with. So how does life work? This is a, my grandfather was an inventor and he flew planes down to Cuba from Georgia and, and worked on cars and he built stuff to fix cars and stuff like that. And I was, a, I love popular mechanics and popular science. And I took things apart and put them back together as I was a kid. And I think I was in college and totally out of the blue, I said, God, how does life work? You know, how do you, how do you do life? And he took me to this really strange scripture in first John. 1 John 2, 16, for the, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but it's of the world. And I said, I just asked you how life works. And you took me how, what the world does? What is it? He says, look it up. Understand that the world took what I created at creation and twisted it and perverted it. And I'm going to teach you how to do how that happened. So I went back to Genesis, Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image in our likeness, let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and livestock rule over all the earth and all creatures that move around the ground. God created man in his image to reflect his glory. In the image of God, he created the male and female and God blessed them. And then he gave them three gifts. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right. Have dominion over everything that I've created here. Right. And then God said, I now also give you the seed bearing plants on the whole face of the earth as fruit in that seed, that will be yours. And so I unpack those as we know, first of all, that eternal life is knowing him. And I referenced this a little bit earlier, but not in this context. Luke 10, 19 says, the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost, not who, but that was what was lost. What was lost? God being able to walk with us in the cool of the day. That creation garden experience, God wants that black back on this planet. All that's happened over the last 6,000 plus years is because God's getting us back to that place. Right. And it said that the son of man came to seek and save, not people, but that which was lost, that, that initial state. Then he unpacks the gift of intimacy, be fruitful, multiply, the gift of authority, have dominion over everything I've created, and the gift of resources. I give you every seed bearing plant, that'll be food. Then we see in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. You're going to see a reoccurring pattern in the next 10 or 15 minutes <laughs> where all the threes in life are connected. <laughs> and once I saw this, and I saw this grid and this matrix, whatever you want to call it, I said, oh my gosh, everything makes sense now. And all these different things where God talks about this and that, and that I know where it fits in the room. I know what it does. I know how to engage with it because I can now see how it's designed. And so when I see this scripture, I said, oh yeah, the thief comes to steal your intimacy. He comes to kill your authority and he comes to destroy your resources. But God said, and Jesus said, I've had came that you may have life and have it incredibly abundant and to demonstrate that. So we're going to look at a lot of threes. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures. I've got a piece of paper to hand out to you. 
and I'll also put it into the, uh, the chat later on, but I'm going to unpack and just absorb this. Don't take time to write it down because it's a lot, but we're just going to do a, a, a overview and then Lynn's going to come up and do some activation on how we can apply some of these uh, principles. So first of all, the expression of God that releases intimacy in our life is the son of God. He's the body of God, right? The expression of God that releases authority is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. And the expression of God that releases resources is the father, the soul of God. The part of man that, re that relates to intimacy is the physical body, and that's pretty explanatory. The part of man that relates to authority is the spiritual body, which is our heart. And the part of man that relates to resources is the soul, the mind, will, and emotions. Now, the sphere of influence that we experience intimacy is within our friends and family. Where we experience authority operating in our work is in our work and our ministry. That's where we experience that. And then where we experience resources is within the community. You cannot create wealth by exchanging with just your family or just inside your business. You have to do business with other people in the community, whether that's local or around the world, to create wealth, to create resources. And again, a lot of this may not make sense. It makes sense to me, and I can go into a deeper teaching with that. But right now, just kind of hear me out. And, and again, a lot of this also can play into other areas. But I think it's fascinating how this plays out. The essence of or the common expression of intimacy is being, be a man, you know, the essence or the common expression of authority is speaking. It says Jesus spoke as one who had authority, it says in the Bible. The essence or the common expression of resources is doing and giving in that phrase, just do it. Then we move to the perspective or the action that's required for intimacy to take place is holiness, keeping it special, just like fire. And a fireplace is beautiful. <laughs> My wife uh, lit a fireplace this, this, uh, <laughs> this past uh, week, and it was just roaring and raging. And it was just like, wow, that's so incredible. But outside of that fireplace, it would burn the house down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And that's how intimacy works. If it's outside of the fireplace, it destroys. <laughs> and so the action and the perspective that's required is to keep it special, holy. The perspective or action that's required for authority is honesty keeping it accountable. And the perspective or the action that's required for resources is honor to keep it flowing. The character quality that's needed for intimacy is purity. The character quality that's needed for authority is humility. And the character quality that's needed for resources is generosity. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. The personal sacrifice required for intimacy is time. Out of all the things in your relationship, what do people value the most? Spending time with you, right? The personal sacrifice that's required for authority in your work and your ministry is your talent, your skill set, who God created you to be and perfecting that and, and getting educated so you can fine tune your talent to serve the way God designed it. The personal sacrifice that's required for resources is treasure. Haven't we heard the term before, time, talent, and treasure? Where did that come from? <laughs> this just blows me away when God starts showing me all this kind of stuff. The physical and the spiritual activity of intimacy is breathing and, and praying in, this, in agreement. The physical and the spiritual activity of, of authority is exercising, worshiping in spirit and truth, and the physical and spiritual activity of, eat, of uh, resources of eating, ministering in the Father's heart. So there's a lot to unpack there, but we'll move beyond. One of my other questions I asked God was, why are there 10 commandments? I know there's like 613 for the Jewish people to, in, articulated in, in the Old Testament, but you said you gave Moses 10 commandments. Why those 10? <laughs> and he began to unpack some of that. The first thing that he began to unpack is that the first four commandments, keeping God's name, keeping the Sabbath, you know, not saying his name in vain, all those things, that deals with our relationship with him. But the other six deal with these three gifts of life. The first three are the three inner commandments, things that take place on the inside of us, and that is within the gift of intimacy, you can't be a liar. If you lie, you're destroying all kinds of trust. So God says, don't lie. The, three, the inner commandment relating to authority is the basis of all authority, and that is honoring our parents and what that blessing that that brings. And then the other commandment is don't covet. If the pattern fits, then the outer commandments is, and the realm of intimacy is don't commit adultery, which is pretty obvious, and then don't commit murder, which is taking authority that you do not have. God gives that to the state for his purposes. And then if the pattern fits, don't steal. <laughs> like oh my gosh that makes total sense 
The master key that unlocks intimacy is questions, asking, will you marry me? Will you be my friend? The master key that unlocks authority is to seek. In the business realm, you're always seeking places to serve and market needs to meet. And that's that you're always looking, you're doing that research that's needed to make your business uh, valid and, 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 and engaging. The master key that unlocks resources is to knock on those doors of opportunities and open up those resources that are there. The primary focus of attention within the gift of int intimacy is people, who you know. The primary focus of attention within authority is places. In your business, you're always focusing on like location, location, location. That will kill or bless your businesses where you're located. And now many people have a global business because of the technology that we have. The primary focus and attention within resources yeah. is things, exchanging things for profit. So that other phrase, people, places, and things, where do those three words come from? From intimacy, authority, and resources. And then just wrapping up here, the primary area of conflict that takes place within the gift of intimacy is between man and woman and others. And so that was the, the next thing that happened after the fall of man is that God said there's going to be a conflict inside your gift of intimacy with your spouse. <laughs> you know, your spouse is only going to do one thing and that you're, you're going to do another thing. And there's going to be that conflict that takes place and inside those relationships. The primary area of conflict between authority is between man and the enemy. The next thing that happened in the fall is that God then said that the enemy would, would rule over and yet he would crush his head. You know, he's going to bite your heel, but you're going to crush his head. And there's this conflict that takes place where now, guess what? The enemy has the keys to the earth and you're going to have to do battle with him on that realm. In that area of your work and your ministry, you're going to come head to head with the enemy. And that's very critical to understand where that conflict is. And then he said, finally, in the gift of resources, the primary area of conflict within resources is between man and the land. He said, now the land, you're moving from tending the garden to tilling the soil. And it's by the sweat of your brow. And now the soil is going to bring forth thorns and thistles rather than you just picking what you need off the trees. And so there's a, a conflict that takes place. It's going to create hard work for you to engage with the resources in your life. And that's between. And we see this in the title of our today's presentation is the world's focus on intimacy is sex with anything. Doesn't matter, it all goes. The world's focus for authority is to have power over everyone. And we're seeing that in our culture where people are doing stupid stuff all over the planet because they want power over people. And then you see the world's focus on the gift of resources where it's money for everything you know, being able to buy whatever. And aren't all of those three just so heavily emphasized right now what we see in society? Exactly, in our culture, exactly. The evil character, uh, evil Bible character and the spirit that's relating to the gift of intimacy is Jezebel. And that is the Asteros spirit, sexual perversion. That always was a major thing in the Bible. God said, don't do these things because it's gonna lead you down to this path away from me. The evil Bible character and spirit relating to authority is Absalom. That's Baal in the systems of slavery that takes place in our work and ministry outside the Babylonian system. And then the evil character uh, that our spirit relating to resources is Balaam or Molech, which was the god of violence and the death. And that's, that's the aspect of where we actually are sacrificing our babies, our legacy, our future resources to the god of Molech. And thus, that's why abortion is so preeminent in our world today is that that's the, the premise behind that. <clears throat> now, this is fascinating. The teaching or the temptation of Jesus that was related to the gift of intimacy, they were all about his identity. And that's another whole topic of discussion. But the particular one that connects to intimacy is that God, the enemy was saying to him, hey, you're tight with God. Just jump off the temple. He'll catch you. You know, He's going to test that relationship with his father, that intimacy that he had. The temptation that he, in, in the area of authority is, dude, you can do anything. Why don't you just change the stone to bread? <laughs> You're hungry, right? Use your authority for yourself, you know? And then the temptation for Jesus relating to resources is, dude, I own all this stuff. I'll give it to you if you worship me. That's all you got to do. Don't have to go to the cross. Just bow down and worship me. And I think this is the final one. Dem Jesus demonstrated intimacy by walking in purity with men and women. He demonstrated authority by speaking with humility and authority. 
those he spoke as one in authority, and he demonstrated resources by releasing healing and provision and deliverance. He was all about releasing um, the things that people needed. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb, by knowing what Jesus did on the cross, and that takes that intimacy, that knowing of who he is and, and what we're about. We overcome the enemy in the area of authority by the word of our testimony, by releasing and declaring it. And we overcome the enemy in the area of resources by not loving, le loving our lives unto death and being able to be generous in that element. Yes. And then the armor, the defensive area of man that is focused within uh, intimacy is the belt of truth that protects the loins. In an area of authority, it's the breastplate of righteousness that protects the heart. In the area of resources, it's the helmet of salvation to protect the soul. And the offensive weapons of the armor is to buy the shield of faith to quench the lies of the enemy. I mean, again, lying and, and telling the truth is, is tied to intimacy. The sword of the spirit to destroy uh, uh, the, the death in our authority area. And then by the shoes of, of peace to extend God's kingdom. So I want to talk about the fact that we all of this starts with knowing God. Or we can be in the world's camp and with the enemy by engaging with understanding what death is. And we're in a death culture. We're going to, the world's going to celebrate death on Sunday. It's all about in that capacity. And the world and the enemy will lead you to incredible resources, incredible authority, and incredible intimacy. But it's along the road of perversion and pride and greed. And you lose your soul. But God's saying, I've got a path for all of us. That is incredible resources, incredible authority, and incredible intimacy with your friends and with your spouse in the area of purity and humility and in generosity. That's what turns these things on, you know, like we've talked about. So we need to choose. Either we're going to have more life or more death. Is that making sense? So that's a, that's a big overview. Lynn's going to unpack that. I'm going to wrap up with this amazing study. Um, if you go to fourthturning.com, that's listed on this. I want to kind of bring this home. How do we apply this today? Uh, Exodus 34, 7 says, keeping mercy for the thousands and forgiving iniquity and transitions and sins that will be by no means clear the guilty, but visiting the, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generations. I'm showing that scripture because God says, I'm gonna bless you to the thousandth generation, but what I'm about to show you is something that's limited to the third and fourth generation. And this is the, the aspect of man and fallen man and how man interacts with man and how culture interacts. This is what happens. And this is a, a called generational science. And it's a fascinating study that pours out. These two scientists, uh, Strauss and Howell, wrote a book called Millennials Rising, and they published this website called Fourth Turning, where every culture and society goes through these seasons and these turnings because of the way the different generationals interact with each other. And this kind of lays that out. There's a high turning of the first turning, the spring, which in our case, in this last uh, sanctum that, that took place, started in 1946 and go through 64. I was born in 64. Then the second turning was the summer, the awakening time, and that's from 65 to 84. And then there was a third turning, the unraveling, the fall season, which started in 85 to 2007. And then you have the fourth turning, which is where we are today. And that's a crisis. It's a winter season. The, the community reacts differently because we're all about survival to get through the winter. And it's our next kids and the adults behind us, uh, after us, that are going to pull us into this next season. So that started around 2008 and nine. And there's four different types that he art, they articulate, the prophet and the nomad, the hero and the artist. So let me share how this played out. And this research that these guys did goes back to 1435, Europe history as well as American history, and then it's global. But the turning away, the four generations and the turning point, this is the critical point we're on. We're in this point right now. And I'm gonna share with that what that looks like. So this is the, the, the chart of when the, the last series of the series that took place in the 1700s and how that took place. And if you notice that second box there, that was the great awakening that happened right before the American Revolution. So everywhere uh, you'll see this pendulum shift where there's this great awakening toward God during the, the summertime. And then there's this falling away, away from God. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. And so the great awakening, the first one there was in the 1700s that led up to 
the crisis winter period, which was the American Revolution. The next one took place, and there was this transcendental awakening that took place in the 1800s that then set the stage for the Civil War. That particular crisis winter season was only five years, and then it shifted because so many people died during the Civil War. The last one after that took place, that was the third Great Awakening in the 1800s that opened up and set the stage for the World War I and Prohibition and then the Great Depression. And then the final one here is, was the American High and then the Conscious Revolution. So you notice, again, there was a Great Awakening and then it, the pendulum shifted to Transcendental Awakening. Then it was the third Great Awakening and then the pendulum shifted to Conscious Revolution that took place in the 60s and 80s. Guess what's happening now? We're moving back toward God. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The next spring and summer is right. going to be massive, massive closeness to God. That's the fourth great awakening, yes. the third one, you know, that yes. we keep talking about. And pray. this is where we are right now. We're in that millennial crisis. How long and that takes or not, I'm not sure. And what that plays out, but it's absolutely fascinating. The other thing that I want to highlight here, if you look at that last column, you today living in this context and in today's time you are facing the same stuff that our forefathers faced when they were facing the decisions they had to make about the revolution or war of america whether they were going to fight the british and create this new entity called america united states of america or whether they were going to not fight and just let it go and just not be a part of it and if you remember most of the people that signed the declaration of independence lost everything and died they, they laid, laid everything down for us to have what we have today. We're facing the same thing that Abraham Lincoln faced with the Civil War, ripping the nation apart, but God kept it together. We face the same thing that the Great Depression and World War II folks faced. That's the season that we're in. See the magnitude of that? Once we get through this, and it started around 2008 with some trigger points, maybe 2001 with the 9-11, but more so around that time, once we get through this, it's going to be a whole new world in error right. as this thing starts over. Right. And the beauty of what's happening now is that since 1946, we've experienced this fourth turning with several things happening. Never before has population and technology exploded exponentially like we have today. These cycles that were happening isolated on all the different continents around the world are now in sync and they're global. So when the economy crashed in 2008, it was a global crash because we're all in sync now because of technology. The other thing is God's fulfilling biblical prophecies in the land of Israel like never before. So now he's moving his clock to get the Jewish people reestablished. And that happened, as we know, in 1948. Where those other trains were a little bit more physical, this one's more relational too. Yep, exactly. So how should we live? How should we respond my premise to you today, as I wrap up here, is that we need to have the right perspective on life, going back to seeking the peace of our city and praying, walking as Esther did, and moving forward with our whole heart. We need to operate with the tools that God's given us, tool of truth, promise, faith, hope, and love, God's grace upon our life, and walking in righteousness. We need to operate within the gift of intimacy, authority, and resources, the way God designed so that our families can be blessed, so that our businesses and our ministries can be blessed, so that our community can be blessed. Anytime the enemy trips us up and says, oh, I'll just work, look at a little porn, or I'll just have an affair, that won't help, that won't hurt anything. Dude, every time you try to work with stuff in your work or your, your, your ministry, you're, the enemy's going to point back to and say, you don't have any authority here because of what you did back there. He's going to hold that over to you until you Forgive yourself and move beyond that and get healed of it. Right, right. For, you know, confess your sins to God, you'll be healed. Confess your sins to one another that you may be, you know, confess your sins to God that you may be forgiven. Confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. So, you know, that's critical is that yes. we operate in this place of intimacy so that we can deal with the enemy in the air of authority. That's right. Because where are we going? God wants us to have the resources that we need to have because he wants to bless us to our children's and our children's children. That's God's design, not for us to die in poverty. That's not God's design. And so I, I didn't talk about understanding your spirit shape or, or your body and soul shape and so forth. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I'll wrap up with this. And that is, 
as we're looking at the seven mountains and the seven areas of influence, and we know that God reveals himself in, in mercy through family, and then he reveals himself as, as a, a ruler through government, and then as giver through faith, and then exhorter through entertainment and arts, and then teacher through education and servant through business, and then prophet uh, through media. And those are the seven gifts that I mentioned, the, the charismata that Ben talked about earlier, the gift of mercy, the gift of ruler, giver, exhorter, teacher. Those are those seven charismata that are listed in Romans chapter 12. And that's another whole amazing teaching on how all the sevens in the Bible are connected <laughs> that author Burke talks and teaches about. But I laid this out one day in this particular area. And the Lord said to me, I want you to focus in on praying for families on Saturday. And that makes sense. Most families get together on Saturdays. And we were doing this at the radio station. Then I want you to pray for the faith community on Sundays. I said, okay, that sounds pretty natural and normal. Then he said, on Mondays, I want you to pray for business. Because that's the start of the business work week in the Western culture, except for, you know, Israel, which is Sundays. Uh, but then I, he said, I want you to focus in on government on Tuesdays. Why do we have our elections on Tuesdays? I don't know. Yeah, just another case in point. <laughs> That's another question I got to find an answer to. But he said, on Tuesdays, I want you to focus in on government. Yeah, there is an election next Tuesday. <laughs> and then he said, on Wednesdays, I want you to focus in on education. And the reason why I highlighted that, he says, remember the See You at the Poll movement where I had this prayer gathering taking place at flagpoles all over schools all over America back you know, the last 20, 30 years, whatever. He says that happens on Wednesdays and Wednesdays in the middle of the education week. And so he said, just pick Wednesdays. And then he said, on Thursdays, I want you to focus in on media and communication because a lot of people are working on weekend stories, on newspapers and news feeds and they're planning things and so forth. Media is a big day on Thursdays. And I didn't know that until I got into media that it is. Then he said, obviously, I want you to work on and pray into arts and entertainment and sports like Friday night football. <laughs> going seeing movie premieres, you know, are happening on Fridays. And I said, okay. So this is how we laid out praying on each one of the days and each one of the spheres of influence. And we did this for years and, and, and I'd love to see a, a movement of this taking place. And I said, Lord, what are you showing me? And he said, I'm building my crown. Oh, <laughs> so cool. The systems and the areas of influence is what God's creating is his kingdom model of how cities and nations are supposed to function and so i was fascinated to see how god put all that together <laughs>